Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual random review and our first review of the season. Do you all have your coffee and cookies? My name is Deborah Goldenberg. Uh, Connie, George, you and I coordinate the random review program for the Friends of the Library who sponsor these events. Um, Connie, why don't you turn on your camera and give a wave to our audience? There she is. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Um, there are 203 people registered for this event, and I'm glad we don't have to find chairs for all of you. I wish I could see you all, but your cameras and microphones are turned off during this event. This system usually works pretty well for most people, but if you're having problems or have a question, you can type it in the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to help with technical issues, but if they can't be resolved, we're recording this talk and you'll be able to watch it in a few days by accessing a link on the random review page on the library's website. Also, on the same page, you'll be able to find a link to a list of books that are related to today's topic. If you have a question for our reviewer, um, please type it in the question box and he'll try and answer at least most of them at the end of his talk. You may also be able to see a place on your go to meeting con go to go to webinar control panel uh, that contains handout documents. One of them is a page that has two links on it. One link connects to a form to fill out if you'd like to join the Friends of the Library. The Friends provide funding for programs that are not in the budget for the library, such as the summer reading program and bags for all those home deliveries you've been receiving. Memberships and donations help support these programs and are so appreciated, especially during these times when book sales aren't possible. We have no book sales scheduled for the upcoming year, but we'll let you know as soon as we do. The other link on the same handout will allow you to join our new mailing list. If you'd like to receive random review news about once a month, send an email to the address on the handout, friends.randomreview at gmail.com, and let us know you'd like to be added to the list. If you can't find the handouts, don't worry. Uh, we'll send them out to you in a follow-up email. I'd like to say thank you to our local sponsors, uh, Grassroots Books and Music, who helps provide books for our reviewers and gives us great publicity, Northwest Graphic Imaging, who designed our annual poster, the Corvallis Gazette Times, and especially reporter Jim Day. They've been very supportive of our program and have provided excellent publicity. And thanks to the best library, and especially Bonnie Brzezowski and Mike Hansen, who are hosting this webinar and have put a lot of work into making this possible. Next month's review will be a little later in the month than usual. It will be on October 21st and will feature the National Book Award winning book, The Yellow House, reviewed by Faye Stetswaters, who reviewed Becoming for us uh, last February. Now I'd like to ask librarian Bonnie Brzezowski to join me on the screen and introduce today's speaker. And I'll say goodbye and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Deborah, for inviting me on screen and here to introduce Mike. I'm really excited to introduce Mike today because there's really not a better person to review this book. As former editor of the Gazette Times and the Democrat Herald, Mike McAnally has a long history of working in local journalism. He's also someone who's trusted and respected by our community. Being an editor of the local paper often, often puts one in a highly regarded position in the community, even if not everyone may have agreed with him at all times. To illustrate the trust we all generally have in local news sites, think about how fake news websites typically impersonate, impersonate local news sites. They're relying on the fact that you trust local news, any local news, more than national or other news sites. I think this level of trust and regard is one of the reasons why 
when Mike actually mentioned me and work I did at the library in two of his editorials during his tenure as, um, as editor, the editorials you may have known as Think Too Much, this made me feel incredibly important and like I mattered to the community. I mean, if the editor of the paper takes note of what you're doing, then surely you must be on your way to fame and fortune. But joking aside, local news shapes our lives. Thus our local newspaper editor who shapes the reporting of that news shapes our lives as well. So in other words, Mike has spent a lot of time shaping our lives. We actually chose Mike as the MC of our popular Sip and Spell Spelling Bee for Adults here at the library because we think the editor of our local newspaper just understands our local character. He's been so wonderful in the role of MC because he's someone we've looked to for years to help us understand and see the value in our community as well as in one another. Even though he's not our editor anymore, the knowledge he holds of our local area remains with him and is something I think we can all really learn from. But before I turn it over to Mike, let me give you some actual specifics about Mike's many qualifications for discussing this title, Breaking News by Alan Rusbridger. So Mike McAnally was the editor of the Corvallis Gazette Times and the Albany Democrat Herald until he was laid off for budgetary reasons in November 2019. His duties at the GT and at the DH included writing editorials and editing the opinion pages of the newspapers, supervising and writing for the paper's arts and entertainment section, and selecting breaking cat news for the comics page, a decision he does not regret. His 39 years as a working journalist included stints as a reporter and editor at the Missoulian newspaper in Missoula, Montana. He was serving as the Missoulian's editor when he was named the publisher of the Gazette Times in 2005, and he managed to successfully work his way back down to editor in the space of just a few years. Currently, he's working as a freelance writer and editor and continuing to search for opportunities that pay just a little bit better than that freelance life. He's also impatiently waiting for the coronavirus to ebb to the point where we can finally get on with the next sip and spell, Spelling Bee for Adults. You and me both, Mike. Why don't you join us on screen so we can have you take it away. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm a little overwhelmed by that uh, introduction and I'm pretty sure that everything I say um, from here on out will let you down in some fundamental way. <laughs> no, no. Thanks, thanks also to Deborah and to Connie and to Mike Hansen and the Friends of the Library for for setting this up. And thanks to all of you for joining us for the first um, random review of the 2020-21 season and the very first one to be held remotely. I'm speaking from the dining room, dining area of my house. I have the First Amendment poster hanging behind me. Uh, it's actually not on the wall regularly, but but maybe it sh should be. I'm. We've shut up both of the cats in bedrooms where they presumably can't bother us for the next hour, and um, and we'll get going. So some other notes about today. Even though we're not meeting in person, I still felt compelled to get a haircut. You'll have to guess whether I'm wearing pants. I bet you never had to guess that about any of the other previous random review sessions before. I did buy a microphone specifically for this session because I wanted the sound to be good. You may violently disagree with everything I have to say here over the next hour, but I want you at least to be able to hear it. In this regard, I hope this random review will be somewhat better than the movie Tenet. So let me walk you through what I hope will happen over the course of the next hour. Now, I'm told by the organizers that I actually have to review the book, and I'll do that if only to satisfy you random review fans. We'll spend a little more than half an hour talking about it, talking about the book in some detail. And here's a spoiler. I was really impressed by the book, Breaking News, the remaking of Journalism, Why It Matters Now by Alan Rusbridger. It seems to wander a bit, but there's a point to that, I think, and we'll get to it. Now, Russ Bridger does a particularly good job, I think, in outlining the often agonizing transition that newspapers, both big ones and small ones, have had to make in the transition to digital. Now, this is a transition that isn't over yet, not by any means, and the fate of many newspapers still hangs in the balance, even though The Guardian seemingly and thankfully has found a formula that works for it. But some of the big questions that Rustberger grappled with when he was editor of The Guardian are very similar to the questions we grappled with at the newspapers where I've worked. 
although certainly not on the scale that The Guardian has had to deal with. Well, after we've discussed the book, I'll pivot and talk about a related topic that Rustberger doesn't deal with very much, and that's, and that's the state of local newspapers like the Gazette Times. Now, this would be a good time to remind you that among the terms of the severance package I, I signed with Lee Enterprises, the owner of the GT, was a clause insisting that I not denigrate Lee. And that's fine. After all, money from the severance package helped pay for the microphone I'm using today. It also paid for the haircut. But at the risk of losing most of my audience already, I don't have the intention today to badmouth the GT or Lee. Instead, I want to focus on the challenges facing small local newspapers like the GT as they struggle to marshal their resources to provide coverage of their communities. And those challenges are considerable and have real implications for communities throughout the United States. As we get near the end of the hour, I'll pivot again and start to answer some of your questions. And finally, because nobody needs to be in virtual meetings of any kind that last much more than an hour, we'll cut it off near the top of the hour. But if we have questions that are still pending at the time, I'll make a special offer at the time. So that's what I hope will happen. What likely will happen is that one of the cats will escape from the bedrooms, climb onto the laptop, kick my laptop into airplane mode. This actually happened once and we'll lose the entire thing. So let's start before that actually happens. And let's start with a little background about Russ Bridger himself. For 20 years, Russ Bridger was the editor of The Guardian before stepping down from that position in 2015, as it turns out. And I thought this was interesting. He also is an accomplished amateur classical pianist. Much of his, most of his journalism career was spent at The Guardian. Although, as he explains in Breaking News, he started his career as an intern for two summers at the Cambridge Evening News. After graduating with a degree in English literature, God, God bless him, he went to work full time for the evening news. Oddly enough, this is, give or take a couple of years, roughly the same period when I started my journalism career, working as a summer intern at the Missoulian newspaper in Missoula, Montana. Russ Bridger's description of his early days at the evening news struck me as some of the liveliest writing in the book, but maybe that's because there was a lot there that resonated with me. You might think, for example, that he's stretching the truth with the anecdote about the reader who brought in a potato shaped like Winston Churchill. But, well, all potatoes look like Winston Churchill. But in the lore of the Democrat Herald, there's a tale about a reader who brought in a zucchini shaped like a duck. And since it was an exceptionally slow news day, the paper did a story about it. On a similar note, Russ Bridger tells a story uh, about the paper's coverage of, of soccer football, as they say in England, that involved a list of soccer cliches. For every cliche that somehow made it past the eyes of weakened editors and made it into print, drinks had to be bought for colleagues. Now, again, this, has, this resonates with truth because in Missoula, we had a similar list. We maintained a similar list of cliches about the weather. And we had a contest to see how many of those cliches we could sometimes work into stories. So, this is how snow becomes white stuff in weather stories. Now, I stayed 25 years in Missoula, eventually becoming the editor of the paper there before I left for Corvallis for a, a job as a publisher of the Gazette Times. Russ Bridger left Cambridge for a reporting job with The Guardian in 1979. That, incidentally, was the year I served as a summer intern in Missoula. And except for small details to work, small detours to work for other papers, he was with The Guardian for most of his journalism career. Now, his tenure as editor ran from 1995 to 2015 when he resigned. His run at the top of The Guardian coincided with a number of trends that deeply shook the foundations of newspaper journalism, from economic shocks to the advent of the internet and social media up to today with cries of fake news frequently coming from the most powerful man in the world. So by early 2017, as Russ Bridger writes in his introduction, Quote, we are up now to our necks in a seething, ever-churning ocean of information, some of it true, much of it wrong. And even worse, as he writes, we are for the first time in modern history facing the prospect of how societies would exist without reliable news, at least as it used to be understood. Now, much of breaking news outlines how The Guardian approached these challenges. And I think there's a lot of merit, maybe even a useful path forward for news organizations and taking a careful look at how The Guardian did it. But 
spoiler alert, this story isn't anywhere near over, as Russ Berger himself says near the end of the book. This is a story half told, he writes. There is no ending, happy or otherwise. It would be nice for this book to have been a retrospective from the shelter of the other bank safely reached. But for the great majority of news organizations, the other bank is still tantalizingly distant. For many, it's practically invisible. So in this four minute video clip, you get a chance to watch Russ Berger himself speak and to talk about many of the challenges that are still facing journalists, including these still open questions. What is journalism? Who is a journalist and who gets to decide? Let's let the editor himself speak for a little bit. Be, before we go forward then, uh, a couple of important notes to help shape the background of, of Russ Berger's book. First, as Russ Berger himself notes many times during the book, The Guardian's business model is quite unusual among newspaper journalism. Uh, the paper itself dates back to 1821, and Russ Berger's account of how its founder, John Edward Taylor, pushed back against the official account of 1819's Peterloo Massacre is a short course in why good journalism is necessary. In any event, more than a century later, the paper, the Scott family, which owned the paper at the time, placed the Guardian's ownership into the care and ownership of the Scott Trust to preserve and protect the Guardian forever. The members of the Scott family were not in the newspaper business to make money. They believed that the Guardian was a public service. Perhaps needless to say, this ownership model is not particularly common in the United States where many of our newspapers are owned by corporations or in some cases increasingly by hedge, hedge funds which have little interest in providing quality journalists but considerable interest in maximizing profits. Gannett, for example, owns more than 100 daily newspapers in the United States including 23 of the nation's biggest 100 by, uh, by circulation. Gannett also owns newspapers in Salem and Eugene and recently increased its size when it acquired the Gatehouse newspapers, a move which included the Register Guard. So while it's interesting to learn how the Guardian's ownership model has allowed it to focus on what Russ Berger calls serious liberal journalism, this is not an ownership model that I'm familiar with. I worked my entire journalism career for a publicly traded newspaper company, and that sometimes forces its executives and officials to focus on the short term in terms of generating a return to investors. And the Guardian's ownership model, again, is not common in the United States. And we might have a chance to return to this point when we discuss the state of local newspapers later in the hour. So that's one of the important points to keep in mind. Here's a second point to keep in mind. It comes into play in some of the book's later chapters. Britain has a long history of a free inquisitive press, but unlike the United States, it has no constitutional guarantee of press freedom. That means Britain's press has long lacked the freedoms that American newspapers enjoy and helps to explain some of the gantlet that Russ Bridger had to endure when Parliament called him on the carpet to explain the Guardian's decisions to publish some of the information leaked by Edward Snowden and how Scotland Yard got a green light to launch a criminal investigation of the Guardian. This also helps to explain why Russ Bridger felt he needed an editorial ally in the United States and reached out to the New York Times for that. So chalk one up for press freedom in America, but don't get too cocky. The 2020 Press Freedom Index, compiled by the organization Reporters Without Borders, which rates the level of press freedom in 180 or so countries around the world, rated the United States at number 45. The United Kingdom came in at number 35, ahead of the United States. If you're curious, and I know that you are, Norway has been number one now on that list for four years running. In fact, Scandinavian countries claim the top four spots. Bringing up the rear at number 180 is our good friend, North Korea. Now, one other side note, and a plug for the library. If you're interested at all in learning more about how The Guardian covered the Snowden revelations, I highly recommend the Oscar-winning documentary, Citizen Four. Now, I checked on the library's website yesterday. The library has two copies of Citizen Four, and when I looked, both were available. 
So back to breaking news. One of the things that Russ Berger attempts to do in breaking news, and generally he's very successful at this, is to string together these big questions about the future of journalism through some of the biggest stories that The Guardian dealt with in his tenure at the top. So for example, the Snowden story, which, which breaking news considers at some depth, raises important questions about this notion of public interest that journalists sometimes use to decide whether a story is important. But what do we mean by public interest? What are the competing claims on the public interest? Maybe most importantly, who gets to decide? Now, some of those very same questions roll through Rushberger's account of how The Guardian handled the WikiLeaks case, which involved leaks of important documents regarding the Afghan and Iraqi wars. Now, Rushberger is not the first observer to compare Julian Assange, the, form, the founder of WikiLeaks, to a villain in a James Bond movie, but he draws a somewhat more nuanced portrait of Assange. But the case raises equally fundamental questions about journalism. Journalists have long thought of themselves as gatekeepers, as the people, readers, or viewers trust to be able to sort through the huge sea of information available each day and to tell them what's important and what's not. So a journalist says, basically, here's what you need to know to make sense of your world today. Here's what you need to know to participate in the life of your community. But who appointed journalists into that gatekeeper role? What happens when citizens like Assange uh, appoint themselves as gatekeepers? What happens when the internet allows anyone to be a gatekeeper and gets to decide what's important and what's not? This is one of the key questions that Russ Berger grapples with throughout the course of breaking news. And each one of those big stories, WikiLeaks, Snowden, gives him another chance to examine these questions from another angle, to dig deeper, to probe a little harder, to start to question some of the initial answers that even he had. So it's not much of a surprise that he doesn't come away from these questions with any real hard and fast answers. Although he does suggest some areas in which journalists, serious journalists, can stake out the ground where they can stand and ways in which they can regain public trust and credibility in a time when serious journalism remains at serious risk. Trust me, he writes at the very end of the book, we don't want a world without news. And that may be true, but it still dances around some of the fundamental questions Russ Bridger is grappling with throughout the book. What is news? Who gets, this, this, who gets to decide what it is? It's a little maddening, at least I found it a little maddening, that the epilogue of the book seems to have way more questions than answers. And as Russ Bridger admits, those are questions that are more important than ever before. But part of the reason why the book ends that way is that we're still not certain what economic model will allow newspapers to survive over the long run. And we're still not sure that there'll be an audience remaining that trusts newspapers, or for that matter, cares much about the so-called proper news that most newspapers want to report. So that's why for me, the heart of the book comes as Russ Berger and his colleagues at The Guardian grapple with two big tectonic shifts in the world of journalism. The collapse of the economic model that paid for newspapers and the rise of digital media, which did more than anything else to chip away and hollow out like a death watch or a powder post beetles in Russ Bridger's memorable phrase, that economic model. Those two big themes come together in a vivid scene at the start of chapter 12, in which Russ Bridger and his other, the other executives at The Guardian are getting a briefing in 2005 about a new internet upstart, Craigslist. As the executives slowly begin to understand the implications of what Craigslist means, essentially the collapse of newspaper classified advertising for years, the cash cow at many newspapers, they begin to wonder if they should sell one of their other holdings, the Manchester Evening News, even though the cash flow from the Evening News helped support The Guardian for many years. Russ Bridger writes this about the collapse of classified advertising at that time. Quote, intuitively we, or some of us had known this was going to happen for the past 10 years. It was obvious it was going to happen. But maybe we thought we would get to do it in our own time and in our own way. Now we had our very own death watch beetle hollering out our company from the inside. And because it was so hard at that time to get out of that mindset, the Guardian Media Group decides then not to sell the evening news on the put the, not to sell the evening news. The paper, Russ Berger reports, was still producing a decent cash flow, and the board was convinced that would continue. Somehow, Russ Berger writes, we persuaded ourselves there was life in print yet. By the time five years later that the Guardian board elected to finally sell the evening news, they got pennies on the dollar for the property. 
the thread that holds the book together, holds breaking news together, is how The Guardian, and by extension, some other newspapers, made that bumpy transition to the internet. Chapter three, The New World, is a vivid litany of some of the early missteps that cost newspapers dearly, and Russ Bridger's account of his trip in America in 1993 to learn about the internet is priceless and perhaps a little bit precious. Russ Bridger, for example, brings his freshly bought copy of the Internet for Dummies along for the tour. They travel to Atlanta, where subscribers to the Journal Constitution's online service pay 10 cents a minute to access information over dial-up 1200 bit per second modems. In Atlanta, management loves the idea that the internet is so much cheaper than printing the paper and actually wants to explore the idea that people will print the paper using their printers at home, an idea that actually had a surprisingly long life and may yet, may yet reassert itself. In New York, they find the Times' online operation at the time that consists of one editor, three staffers, and four freelancers who are working with two PCs. They make other stops in Chicago and in Boulder, where Knight Ritter is a team working on the digital future, which they believe is something like the iPad, only in this case it's a block of wood with a mock-up of a front page pasted to the front. And here we pause a moment to remember Knight Ritter, at one time the second largest publisher of newspapers in the United States until it was absorbed by McClatchy, and McClatchy, of course, was absorbed just last week by a hedge fund. After the trip, Russ, Berger, Russ Bridger reaches two solid conclusions. First, he says, quote, it seemed blindingly obvious that the future of information would be mainly digital. Plain old words on paper delivered expensively by essentially Victorian production and distribution methods couldn't in the end compete. Second, he concludes, despite the big brain power of all the people he met on the trip, quote, not one of them had any idea how to make a dime out of it. And then he asks himself this really important question, how on earth could you graft a digital mindset processes onto the stately ocean liner of print? Now the rest of the book describes how the Guardian slowly made that conversion to a digital mindset and even started to make some money in the process. But it's a slow and painful process. Two, after, two years after Russ Berger makes that trip to 2015, the future really kicks in and newspapers are not prepared. No industry in 1995 was as ill-prepared for the digital age or more inclined to poo-poo the disruptive potential of the internet and the World Wide Web than the news business, wrote cultural historian W. Joseph Campbell in his book, 1995, The Year the Future Began. Campbell says that the news business suffered from innovation blindness, an inability or a disinclination to anticipate and understand the consequences of new media technology. Guilty as charged. In 1995 in Missoula, I was working as a city editor, and the process of loading half a dozen or so stories from that day's print edition onto the web each morning was a painfully slow process that took 30 minutes on a good day. And the journalists in the room, the journalists in Missoula, were viewing the whole internet thing as, at best, a distraction from their real work. And I'm inclined, I was inclined at that time to share that view. Now, one of the many things I liked about breaking news is, is how other events constantly interfered with the progress that Russ Bridger wanted to make toward a digital guardian. And truth be told, life in a newsroom, even a small one that covers Corvallis, is a daily exercise in distraction. You may come into the office in the morning, determine that today, today is the day that you're gonna crack this internet thing, only to find that one phone call or one breaking news event renders your plans for the day completely obsolete. That's why newspaper journalism is a great job for someone with a short attention span. In the meantime, in those years after Russ Bridger's trip, The Guardian grapples with the challenges, the daily challenges of producing a newspaper and feeding a website, while it tries to figure out answers to the same questions that everyone else has about the internet. For example, should newspapers charge for access to their websites? At the time, almost nobody was charging for reading stories online, and while today this seems like a genuinely horrendous mistake, or as Alan Mutter put it, the original sin for newspapers, there is some reason for it. The increased audience that online audiences can bring, and the fact that audiences, advertisers can track whether an online ad was effective, something that rarely, if ever, was possible for, for print alone, offers newspapers a chance to greatly expand their audiences. And if only you could figure out a way to monetize those expanded audiences. 
Now at the time, and this was true until recently, when circulation revenue finally began to overtake ad revenue, newspapers made the vast majority of their money from advertising, both display and classified. Money from circulation made up maybe a quarter of revenue at newspapers, enough to cover the cost of your newsroom, or so the rule of thumb kind of went. So it made sense at the time to focus on attracting advertising revenue online, the approach that Russ Bridger calls reach before revenue, and one way to hobble that reach right at the start is to put content behind a paywall. So the Guardian works through related issues such as when to publish online and eventually decides it needs to build a 24-hour model, and of course it has the resources to staff such an around-the-clock model. But even smaller papers have adopted this digital first approach. It's not unusual, for example, to see the GT pro posting to the web during an 18 hour window from 6 a.m. to midnight. And the newspaper and other papers around the world begins to grapple with some of the implications of new media. The Guardian early on started to experiment with talk boards, digital corners where readers could comment on stories or anything else that caught their fancy. These, of course, are the ancestors of today's systems in which readers can post comments on stories. Now, any editor worth her salt will tell you that she has a love-hate relationship with these comments. Even done properly, they take substantial newsroom time to moderate, and they descend with frightening ease and speed into nasty vitriol that often has nothing to do with the subject of the original story. But at the same time, they occasionally offer information or tips that newspapers don't have. I can think of a couple of stories where comments from readers gave us the additional leads that we needed to move ahead. Now, I made a decision a couple of years ago to pull the comments from stories, and on some level, I still regret that decision. Now, before I left the paper, I understood that Lee was planning to roll out another better system for commenting, um, but I don't think that's in place yet, at least not yet at the GT or the DH. But even in those early days of the talk boards, you could sense that a fundamental shift was underway between a newspaper and its readers. Russ Bridger puts it well. For 200 years, journalists had been, had been about pushing stuff out at readers. And now here were real live readers responding instantly to things you were telling them. Our readers know more than we do. Sometimes. Quite often. Now from there, it's a quick jump to the impact of social media giants like Facebook and Google and how those have changed the face of journalism. Russ Bridger has a nice way of phrasing this, quote, Web 1.0 was I look, Web 2.0 was I participate. It's true, most editors want to be in control, but on the social web, no one is in control and everyone can produce content. Russ Bridger also does a nice job at capturing the sheer whiplash of doing journalism in an online era. Quote, that's how weird this time was. You could intellectually understand some of what was happening. You could grasp that this was huge and transformative and would affect everything we did. And yet you could, you could shrug when the latest new new thing came along because you hadn't quite internalized it properly, because half of your head was still in the print world, because there weren't enough hours in the day. Now, there's another big development that goes hand in hand with the rise of the social media giants. As newspapers increasingly made the shift to digital, advertising revenue also shifts from print to digital. The problem there is that tech giants like Google and Facebook, organizations with frankly little interest in producing original content, begin to siphon away the majority of digital advertising revenue for content paid for and produced by news outlets. So the GT, for example, frequently posts summaries of its stories on Facebook, and that pays off in some ways. A good amount of the newspaper's website comes from Facebook. But newspapers still struggle to monetize that additional web traffic as Facebook and Google suck up much of the available dollars on the digital side. Now, Russ Bridger and The Guardian eventually find a model that appears to work for them. They move toward more of a membership model for subscriptions an approach that other newspapers have started to adopt. That's how subscriptions are sold now at the Gazette Times, for example, with different benefits attached to different levels of subscriptions. Now, The Guardian also makes a move toward what it calls, quote, post-print open journalism, unquote, which emphasizes participation and invites responses from readers. And I think this is an essential ingredient for news organizations going forward, although it also brings with it a new set of challenges. The approach 
emphasizes transparency and being open to challenges, including corrections, clarifications, additions to stories. And that strikes me as an essential next step in helping readers, in helping restore readers' trust in newspapers. I'm disappointed a bit that Russ Bridger doesn't spend more time discussing kind of a related idea, that debate that currently surrounds the idea that newspapers need to be objective. Supposedly, objectivity is one of the core tenets of journalism. It's a tricky era. It's a tricky area, and, and it becomes particularly important in an era when the President of the United States is is noted for offering thousands of falsehoods in the four years, the first four years of his term. At its worst, the idea of objectivity leads to so-called false equivalence. And a good example that Russ Bridger cites is the case of a British climate change climate change denier who is regularly given space by mainstream newspapers to, quote, spout dangerous nonsense, let's call it fake news, about something people who do know what they're talking about consider to be a devastating threat to our species. So in some ways, the idea of objectivity can run counter to another tenet of journalism, to determine truth as best we can to find the facts and to show readers how we found them so that they can check them out for themselves. These are ideas that you find again in some of the Guardian's open precepts. But again, it's a tricky bit of business and it showcases how difficult these challenges facing newspapers truly are these days. These challenges were nicely summarized in an influential blog post by the journalism professor Jay Rosen that he wrote uh, in late 2016, shortly after the election of Donald Trump. Here's what Rosen said was ailing newspapers, and I need to take a deep breath because this is a long paragraph. Low trust all around, an emboldened and nationalist right wing that treats the press as a natural enemy. The bill coming due for decades of coasting on a model in political reporting that worked well for junkies, but failed to engage the rest of us. The strange and disorienting fact that reality itself seems to have become a weaker force in politics. The appeal of the strong man and his propaganda within an atmosphere of radical doubt. The difficulty of applying standard methods of journalism to a figure in power who is not trying to represent reality, but to substitute himself for it as a show of strength. The unsuitability of prior routine as professionals in journalism try to confront these confusing conditions. A damaged economic base, weak institutional structure and newsroom monoculture that hinders any creative response and a dawning recognition that freedom of the press is a fragile state, not a constitutional certainty. End quote. Wow. No wonder the future for newspapers remains cloudy. And it's particularly cloudy for local newspapers. So near the end of breaking news, Russ Berger talks about the so-called Trump bump, the phenomenon in which the president's election fueled increases in subscriptions for some national news outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, NPR, ProPublica, The Atlantic, and, and others. The Guardian also enjoyed a boost in subscription rates and donations. That has helped those newsrooms boost their staffing, and it will be very interesting to see if that's a phenomenon that outlasts Trump. Now, that helps for news organizations with a national scope. The picture for local news organizations, those whose primary focus is covering a local community, is considerably cloudier. And when you add a coronavirus pandemic and the resulting economic slowdown to the mixture of other factors that have been affecting journalism, the picture becomes even more troubling. The Pointer Institute, the nonprofit organization that helps to train journalists and tracks trends in journalism, has been tracking how news organizations have been reacting this year to the economic slowdown. It's a list that includes items that we've seen here locally, cut back in print days, for example. Although the GT still publishes seven days a week and increasingly has looked for opportunities to, on certain holidays, such as this week's Labor Day, not to produce a print edition, and you save money in print and delivery costs on days that typically are slow news days. Papers across the nation, including the GT, have instituted furloughs where staffers have to take a week or two off without pay. Executives at companies like Lee, to their credit, have taken pay cuts, Layoffs have ripped through newsrooms large and small, although I am not aware of any recent layoffs at the GT, which is to say, nonsense, shall we say, last November. 
The idea, of course, is to cut costs just to get through a period with a disastrous tumble in revenue from advertising, which still, as we talked about earlier, provides most of the revenue for newspapers. Now, circulation revenue is rapidly approaching advertising revenue, although most of that trend is because advertising revenue has fallen so dramatically. Circulation revenue nationally is growing, but more slowly than revenue is dropping. Smaller newsrooms have faced terrific economic pressure since the recession of 2005. From, 20, from 2004 to 2018, about 1,800 newspapers have closed in the United States, most of them being weeklies that often were the only source of news in their hometowns. Research from Penelope Abernathy at the University of North Carolina suggests that the U.S. is losing about 100 newspapers a year. More than 1,000 news, local newspapers continue to publish, but have become what are called ghost newspapers with very little original reporting. The conditions that have prompted those closures, loss of advertising, the continued erosion of readers for the print product was just exacerbated by this year's economic slowdown. Pointer reported just today that it has been able to find 50 newspapers, again, most of them weeklies, that have closed so far this year. So what are the implications for communities that lose their newspapers? Research by Abernathy and others suggests that communities on newspapers lose transparency and accountability from public officials. Then taxes go up, voter participation goes down. Voters are less politically informed, less likely to run for office. Because newspapers still provide the majority of original local reporting in communities, their evisceration robs the American public of trusted sources of critical information about health, education, elections, and other pressing local issues. And it creates a vacuum in which fake news can flourish. So what can newspapers do? A couple of, Rosen makes a couple of points and I have a couple of additional ones. First, newspapers absolutely need to do a better job of explaining themselves, what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. Now, traditionally, this has not been a strong point for newspapers when the idea was that we were behind the wall, journalists were behind the wall, and we would throw you the newspaper over our high walls in which we were ensconced. But Rosen takes it a little bit farther than that. And he writes that journalists need to think politically about journalism itself, which does not mean to politicize it. Like it or not, the press is a public actor currently in the fight of its life against forces that want to bring it down. This is a political situation par excellence, but nothing in their training or temperament prepares journalists to fight the kind of battle they in. They think they would rather chase stories, public what they find and let the politics care of itself. But that won't cut it anymore. Now Rosen continues, what I mean by think politically involves basic questions. What do we stand for that others also believe in? Who is aligned against us? Where are we most vulnerable? How can we broaden our base? Who are our natural allies? What can we unite around despite our internal differences? What are the overlapping interests that might permit us to make common cause with people who are not journalists? That's, that's Rosen on that, and that's an interesting point. I'm not 100% sure I agree, but that certainly takes the idea that newspapers need to do a better job explaining themselves what they do, how they do it, and share that with readers makes sense to me, which flows into the second point that I think newspapers can do. They can adopt a different more open model of journalism that's more in tune with how people get information today. Show your work. Link to your sources so readers can check them out for themselves. Be gracious about correcting items, both in print and online, and be fast about making corrections online. Be more open to the idea that sometimes readers know more than you do. Sometimes. Most of the time. A third point that I kind of stole from Rosen, find coverage patterns that cross the great divide, um, culturally, politically, whatever. What are the areas that affect both sides of the political and cultural spectrum in the Mid-Valley? This is a particularly important question for a newspaper like the Gazette Times or the Democrat Herald, which aim to cover both Benton County and Lynn County. And part of that work involves listening better and listening more frequently to people who are outside their current orbits. So those are three quick steps um, that, quick, they're not quick, they're not easy. Those are three steps that newspapers can do 
to better position themselves to ride out this continuing storm. But I want to talk also about what readers can do. Obviously, financial support is incredibly valuable. If you can't afford a print subscription, and I understand that, you can pay for access to a website. Now you can buy access for to the GT, and this includes access to a digital replica of the printed paper for about 10 bucks a month. That's not that's vital. It's that's vital that you do that. It's not the only thing you need to do. I find that you probably also need to pick a national news source that you trust and pay for access to that. In this case, in my case, I, I pay 17 bucks a month for the New York Times access. Um, I'm probably paying too much. I bet you can find a better offer. As a side note, I, I pay a little more each month for access to the Times' outstanding cooking site, which also offers an outstanding example of how to handle comments from readers. So support, offer financial support where you can. Second, participate. Now you can't comment yet on stories that are posted on the websites, but you can contact reporters and editors directly through email or Twitter or other systems. Send along news tips, but understand when the newspaper can't get to all of the stories you suggest. Let the paper know when you get when it gets something wrong, but try to do it in a civil way. Journalism today really and irrevocably is a two-way street, but readers have a role in that as well. On a related note, consider occasionally sending a nice note to a reporter or an editor. You may find this hard to believe, but it's fairly rare for reporters to get positive notes from members of the public. Now, Russ Bridger compares reporters to bees, and there's truth there. Reporters, I think, are the single most essential part of the journalism ecosystem, and they deserve some tender care once in a while. Three, become a savvier consumer of news. Learn how to tell the difference between real and fake news. This likely has never been more important than it is today. The library, another plug for the library, occasionally offers classes on how to do exactly that, and there are plenty of other resources available online. The Pointer Institute's website at pointer.org has some, has some other suggestions for how to build your media literacy, which is such an important skill these days. Fourth, newsrooms need to expand the circle of people that they talk to regularly. And the rest of us need to do the same, especially considering how social media tends to push us into bubbles of isolation with other people who think like we do, not to mention our natural human tendency toward confirmation bias to lend more evidence or lend more, lend more credence to data that already confirms the beliefs that we already hold. It's hard, but we need to figure out ways to break out of our own bubbles. So much of this advice was captured recently by the brilliant Stephen Pastis in a recent Sunday version of his comic strip, Pearls Before Swine. And I'm gonna show that to you now, and then we'll see how much time we have for questions. And I am hoping that you can see the screen. So while I leave that, so while, while I leave that up, and I hope you're seeing it, uh, this would be a good time to ask some questions. And if we run out of time to answer questions, and if there are other questions that I can't answer, I will write up answers to them and I will post them with uh, this recording of this random review when it gets up on the library's website. Great, thanks Mike, that was so interesting. And I do have um, three questions so far from the audience, um, if you're ready. I got a question. <laughs> got a question from Shelly. This discussion of financial viability and attractiveness of the print versus digital model reminds me a bit of the time we thought vinyl was dead for music. <laughs> what we've learned is that vinyl is essential to those who care about music because it contains much more information than any digital mode. So can't we boost print by emphasizing the increased information, both width and depth? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, if I had the resources and was still in journalism, I would be following the model that Russ Bridger talks about briefly in the book, where you use the web for breaking news, for links, for 
for more background that people can link to and that you set aside a big chunk of space in the daily paper in the print edition for longer reads. Um, it's really hard still for me, even as an old ink-stained wretch, to read a really long story on the web. But I think print can showcase some of those longer stories, those longer reads, in in ways that you still can't really on the web. So yeah, I would that would be the way I would be pushing the print product. But that requires that requires a separate staff or a, a or it requires people who are working on those longer stories and people who are willing to design them in ways that catch people's eyes. But yeah, I do think that there's something to that there's something to be said in that vinyl CD example. And I say that as somebody with vinyl records still in the garage and uh, unfortunately maybe 500 CDs stashed away in a couple of rooms behind me. So yeah, so I think that's a good point. And I think that's I think that's definitely one model that newspapers can use to kind of use the use the advantages of each of those different media. Okay. Still got to find people to pay for it though on both sides. Right. <laughs> and the question from Eleanor, do you know how successful economically the Guardians please to readers to buy subscriptions for their digital editions? How successful they are at selling their digital editions? I don't have actual recent numbers from the Guardian, but everything I was able to track as I researched the book and read the book suggests that the Guardian is actually pretty happy with how that's gone. And the Guardian goes a step forward. Um, they also encourage donations. And it's sort of, I mean, I don't think there's a paywall up at the Guardian. I think you can, you can sign up for subscriptions, you can donate. That's really similar to what um, the Oregonian has done recently. And um, you know, just like Corvallis needs the Gazette Times, I think the state of Oregon still needs the Oregonian to, to prosper. And I, I, there's no paywall up as far as I understand at the Oregonian site, Oregon Live, but they are asking for people to donate and to be subscribers to that model. So it looks like the Oregonian is sort of following that Guardian model and we'll see we'll see how it works. The difference is, of course, the Oregonian is not a nonprofit organization, so donations wouldn't be tax deductible, I don't think, which also raises a whole question about whether uh, there's a nonprofit model that makes sense for print journalism going forward. And I think there have been some interesting experiments along those way. ProPublica, the investigative journalism outlet is nonprofit, but they're not a newspaper. So I think the jury is still out on that whole question of nonprofit and newspapers. Um, Brooke was wondering if you could identify an example of an editorial decision you made that was most difficult for you to make in terms of both personal and journalistic ethics. Oh, they stretch back uh, oh, a long ways. Some of the earlier ones involved um, questions about whether to run a photo in Missoula. I recall we had a photo that, um, that was taken outside a murder scene that um, shows a grandson of the murder victim getting the news about the murder from the from a police officer on the scene and we we thought about it and thought about it and I ran that photo thinking that it was um, that said something essential about the story and how horrible this event was that you couldn't capture in words and now I don't know if I would run that photo again in in Corvallis and Albany, some of the hardest decisions we had to make typically involved uh, whether you should identify juveniles involved in 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 criminal cases, um, and those were always always difficult. And and I'm I, I still think we probably made some of the correct decisions uh, there. But it, those are instances where it helps to be able to talk through those issues with everyone in the newsroom. And everyone doesn't have to agree. Um, but um, you want to be sure that you've talked them out. So when someone calls you the next day and asks about why did you do this or why did you do that, you at least have an answer ready. Or even better, as we did sometimes uh, with some of these cases involving juveniles. And I'm thinking particularly now of the, the juveniles a few years back who caused that panic at Lebanon High School when one of them brought a 
brought a firearm to the school. Um, I, I ran an editorial the same day that we ran the story with the names sort of explaining why, why we made that decision. And I discovered that it doesn't necessarily reduce the number of calls you get the next day, uh, but at least it allows those discussions to start from a little higher point instead of just immediately starting with the screaming and then working down otherwise. And um, these two may, are maybe somewhat related. Um, what is the ideal business model for dailies going forward? And then Leslie also wondered, um, seeing local newspapers reduce so much of their coverage content over the years, by being that reduced, aren't they actually losing readers? Yeah, you know, no, the circulation, print circulation nationally has declined uh, dramatically over the last 20 years. Now, some of that audience has been regained through digital audiences, which have grown steadily. But again, probably, I'd need to look at some numbers, but probably not as quickly as the industry has shed readers. So yeah, I mean, you worry very much about that death spiral as, as a, a publisher feels like they're forced to cut costs by furloughs or layoffs or, or, or eliminating some print days. And then on the flip side, continues to sort of raise prices um, for the product. Yeah, there definitely is a temptation. You understand why readers call you up and say, I can't afford it, I don't know why you're doing this. Um, but going forward, I think newspapers are gonna have to be smarter about figuring out ways to, to make money off those digital audiences. You follow that Russ Bridger model, it reach before revenue and hope the revenue comes along now. It's harder, it's maybe harder these days than when Russ Bridger and The Guardian was trying to do that because Google and Facebook have become such dominant players in terms of sucking up digital revenue. Um, but still, if you're a local publisher, you still sort of have um, that franchise, that local community coverage. You have to be able to maintain that at any cost. And one of the things I did that I'm generally proud of during my time at the editor, being the editor of the paper was trying to hang on to as many reporters as possible. You hang on to that, you hang on to the franchise, you cover the community better than anybody else can. Um, maybe you take some of your profits and reinvest them back in the, back in the product. You go, um, you, you, you adopt this open model of reporting and editing that I was talking about earlier. Um, and and you go forward. Is that a sure deal? Is that a is that a certain business model? No, absolutely not. Is that the way I would probably try to move forward? Yes. Um, if, and if someone had figured out the if someone had figured out the the economic model for small newspapers going forward, you would bet we would all be rushing toward that instead of being still in this period where well, let's try this idea, let's try that idea. And I think there is some merit in the way Lee and the GT is going on trying to sell these, sell the subscriptions as memberships and getting and beginning to push again, as we did not do for so long, the importance of a newspaper to a local community. It's important that we remember that newspapers in towns like Corvallis and Albany were started by people who believe that a newspaper was an essential part of a successful community and vice versa. I mean, a newspaper to be successful needs a, needs a successful community that relationship is still there. And I think the experience that you see in communities that are losing their newspapers, that have become news deserts, um, starts to underline the importance, the importance of that. And I think you know, some of that, a lot of that obviously rests with the people who are running newspapers. And some of it rests, I think, with readers and, and community members who rely on, rely on newspapers. Now, if, like, if as, as Russ Bridger says, if people have completely lost their lost their desire for a serious or what he calls proper news, I don't know what to do about that. But my belief, my belief, I have to believe that people who care about the community are going to care about the way that they get news about that community, so they can be active, informed members of that community. Great. Which is really a long way of answering. I don't know, but this is what I would try to do if I were still in the game. <laughs> gotcha.
Well, it is just a few minutes after one. We did have a few more questions, but I think we should probably wrap up. And um, we did get a nice little comment from Curtis saying that while breaking cat news was a good addition to the GT mic, adding rubes and pearls before swine was brilliant. Yeah, I, I'm with I'll Curtis on that. With that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, I will, if Bonnie, I think Bonnie will send me the questions that we didn't get to and I will answer them in writing and we'll post them along with the recording of this session. That sounds great. And finally, in case anyone was wondering, I, I am wearing pants. <laughs> it's been revealed. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for attending. And, and I hope that you'll register for the next random review. And um, you can do that on the library's website, cbcpl.net slash random dash review. Um, if you have any questions about how to do any of that, never hesitate to contact us. We're always available to you to help if you're at the library. So thank you all, and I hope we see you next time. Thank you so much, Mike. My pleasure.